The New Testament reading will be from Luke, first chapter, verses 39 through 45. You'll be able to find that on your pew, in your pew Bibles on page 1588, 1588. Listen to hear what God's Word has to say to you personally. At that time, Mary got got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's house home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb bleeped for joy. Blessed is she who has been believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. seems rather sterile to me. The way I see it, love is something we all want, something we all seek, something we all cherish, and definitely something we all need. It's natural. We were born with that desire to feel and know love. To God, the word love is extremely important. I checked the concordance of my Bible, and that four-letter word, just the four-letter version of it, that four-letter word is found in 77 verses. You might say, and? Well, I'll put it in perspective. God, capital G, is found in verse 70 times. Lord, 37. Christ, 33. Jesus, 31. Savior, 18. I believe that shows the significance of that little four-letter word we toss about so freely. And God, through the Bible, gave us his own definition of life. Actually, better than the definition, the Bible gives you a description of what love should look like and what it should feel like. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I want to read a few of the verses there. I'm going to read verses 4 through 8a, and then I'm going to read the 13th verse. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Does not provoked. Thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. God is love. And his word tells us how to model that love. God himself modeled that love, showed the greatest depth of his love, came to us as a child, Jesus. And he did it in a very unlikely manner. The Jews were looking for a savior to free them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. After all, it had been prophesied that God was going to send a savior. They didn't know when, 
just that God had promised them a Savior. There was a description of what the Savior would do. Great acts, rule of nations, prince of peace, mighty counselor. God loved his chosen people and kept his promise. He sent them a Savior. However, he did it in a manner only God could conceive. He chose a virgin, a betrothed virgin from an obscure town in Galilee, Nazareth. God chose two seemingly insignificant individuals living very ordinary lives. But that was about to change. He sent angels to tell the virgin she was chosen to carry his son. And her husband to be was told he was was told he was going to be the son's earthly father. Stop and think about how much they must have loved and feared God. And when I say feared God, please know that to fear God means to revere him very deeply. The Savior of the world coming to earth is a small, innocent, pure, perfect baby. As in the beginning, and the earth was out of form, so it began with the Savior of the world. Now by the time Mary and Joseph arrived in, Beth arrived in Bethlehem, she had within her the well-formed Emmanuel, God with us. God was going to live among us here on earth, experience every, experiencing everything we see and feel, God in the flesh. And after she had given birth, the baby she held, kissed and loved, no ordinary child. She was not holding merely a bump of joy. In her arms, she held a bundle of hope, a bundle of peace, a bundle of joy, a bundle of love. She held the sole means for mankind to find forgiveness for their sins, the only way to salvation. And those who God came to redeem rejected the gift. The very gift that would deliver them from the worst bondage of all, the bondage of sin. They refused to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. You may be saying at this point, whoa, 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 this is time of year we talk about the birth of Christ, not the death. Well, I like what Dr. David Jeremiah had to say in his daily devotional pathways. If you stretched a 2,700-mile long piece of string from east, the East Coast to the West Coast, that would represent eternity. Then if you went to Kansas and put a pencil dot on the midpoint of that string, that would re represent time as we know it on Earth. Then if you went up in the space shuttle and looked down on the string with the little dot in the middle, you'd see time relative to eternity the way God sees everything at once. Our little pencil dot is small compared to the everlasting to the everlasting that God sees, yet it's still significant to him. But because he sees our dot all at once, he sees past, present, and future at the same time. So when God moved the prophets in the Old Testament to tell them of the coming of the Messiah to be born in Bethlehem, the prophets had to wait for it to happen. But God saw the prophecy in its fulfillment all at once. Prophecy is important because it represents a completed event in God's sight. Jesus was born in time, but God saw it in eternity. Don't ever doubt God's promises and prophecies. Once they are spoken, they're as good as done. Now that devotional was ended with the words of the theologian J. Sidlow Baxter, who said, Bethlehem and Golgotha, the manger and the cross, the birth and the death, must always be seen together. When we look at it that way, we get to see the completeness, the beauty, and the love of God's magnificent plan for us. Getting back a little bit more into the season. This is the season. And that's what I would like to talk about this season. As the song goes, tis the season to be jolly. Well, I contend it's always the season to be jolly. 
And the season I'm talking about is not the holiday season. I'm talking about the seasons of our lives. Oh, we all have seasons of our lives. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. And thankfully, as I look out across this congregation, I see all the seasons being represented by this new year. Whatever season of your life you are in, God needs to be the focus of that season. After all, he has blessed you with that time so you can fulfill the purpose he has for you in this world. Remember the love he has shown you, the forgiveness, the life he so willingly sacrificed, the patience. Yes, the patience. Knowing that one day, yes, one day, you will realize the full extent of his love for you. As the soul goes, what is Christmas without Christ? Well, I'll answer that. It's a commercially filled, empty, blind gift giving exercise that leaves one with the question, can I really afford what I just done? <laughs> God never meant for it to be that way. He wants you to remember the real reason. He wants you to repeat that real reason to your children and all the others. And to keep the reason for the celebration alive because Jesus is alive. Yes, we are to be the messengers. Now, in the past three weeks, we have been blessed to receive sermons on hope. It was titled, A People Prepared for the Lord. Peace. The gift, then it was titled, The Gift of Peace. And joy. And it was entitled, Deep Down Joy. Now, in the past two weeks, you have heard a request to close your eyes. Well, this week, I have another eye closer for you. <laughs> okay, come on, close your eyes. Good. Now, I want you to put on your gift of imagination to work. Now, keep your eyes closed. I'm keeping my open so I can keep checking on you to make sure you have them. Okay, now imagine, if you will, that special someone you so dearly love. You know that person that is making you smile right now with merely a thought about him or her. That someone that you want to always be in your life. Okay? Has your heart rate increased a little bit? Now that special person may very well be someone here with you today. Maybe even sitting next to you somewhere nearby. Maybe it's you're sitting in the base section looking down into the soprano section. Or maybe you're in the alto section looking down into the pews. Or maybe you're sitting on a bench looking in a rear view mirror so you can see that special someone. Just keep that person in your mind. Think about the wonderful times you've had together. Those shared special moments. And when you're apart, you can't wait to be together again. Yes, that's someone you love more than anyone or anything. Still with me? Now I have a question to ask you. Could you sacrifice your beloved, the one you love, <clears throat> more than anyone or anything? Could you sacrifice a special someone that, so that someone else could live. That's exactly what God did for you. He sacrificed his one and only son, his son in whom he was well pleased, the unblemished lamb. God so loved us that he gave the greatest gift he had so that we may not die, so that we may live. I don't know about you, but I am at a loss for words to describe the depth of that kind of love. There is no human alive that I can truly say loves me that much. And then I think, when is the last time I told God how much I love him? When is the last time I professed my undying love 
for my father who has given me life, friends, immeasurable love, guidance, growing pains to be endured with him by my side. Give me everything. When was the last time? I wish to end this with a very simple prayer. God, I love you with all my heart, with all my soul,